Hey, everybody, before we start the show, I just wanted to take a moment to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by D&D Beyond. D&D Beyond are the makers of the premier digital tool set for Dungeons and Dragons official. They're official people, and you can go check them out. You can start playing around with a lot of the tools for free. Why? Because basic rules and things like the Elemental Evil Player Companion are free, and so they're there, and you can go try it out. Uh, Start playing around with the Character Builder, which is truly incredible, and there's all kinds of other great stuff on D&D Beyond. Encounter Builders, they have a roadmap there that will show you where they are going, constantly making new improvements, constantly pumping out free content like articles from James Hake and incredible videos from Todd Kenrick. Plus, they're getting all kinds of new writers up in there. Maybe you saw that DC is in there writing some incredible articles or The Ashley Warren. That's right, The Ashley Warren. So go check it out. It's all over at dndbeyond.com. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intercasso. the show, I am talking with Ashley Gilbert of Eldritch Foundry. Eldritch Foundry is this really cool site that is going to allow you to make custom minis for your games. And I'm not just talking about medieval fantasy PC heroes. I'm talking about all kinds of stuff. Monsters. You're going to be able to create monsters with this thing. Plus, they've created original lore to go along with their miniatures that you can create. Uh, It is a really fascinating conversation about how this company was created, but also what they're doing, how they envision themselves and the creators that they are. And Ashley herself is just an incredible person, a creator herself, and really taking the world by storm. Uh, Her background with D&D is truly fascinating. So we talk about that. We talk about role-playing games in general. Uh, It is a really fun conversation. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Here it is. Okay, everybody, now I am here with Ashley Gilbert, who is a legend, a legend here in the tabletop gaming industry. Um, Ashley, for people who don't know, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? Um, Well, apparently I'm a legend. A legend. (laughs) But you said it, not me. So, (laughs) anywho, I am Ashley. I am the community manager for Eldritch Foundry. Some of you might have seen me running around D&D Live as a little gold tiefling with purple hair. That is me. Was I a gold tiefling with purple hair when we met, James? I believe you were normal when we met. Uh, It was like the last day, I want to say. There were like three different phases where I was like a gold tiefling with purple hair. And then I took all of it off and I couldn't get my makeup off. So I just ran around with gold paint on me. (laughs) So, like, some people only know me as the gold tiefling. Some people know me, like, as my regular look. I don't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you had, like, a, a gold sheen to you. But I may be making, this may be a podcast inception that you have done to me here that is making me think of things that way. <laughs> well, the gold sheen is probably most definitely a possibility. Because they used the good stuff on me and it was hard to get off. Yes, yeah, and you also work for Eldritch Foundry, which is one of the things that we're going to be talking about today for sure. But first, Ashley, I would love for you to take me back. Uh, When did you first play a tabletop role-playing game and sort of give to me the circumstances? Were you playing a character? Were you the GM? All that kind of stuff. So I am not so much a noob to Mm D&D, But I am, like, within the last five years, like, a, a newbie to D&D. So I knew about D&D um, more so in these latter years of my life. Um, I knew it was a super nerdy thing. Um, and when I started dating my, well, my now fiancé, my boyfriend at the time, now my fiancé, he was like, you know, I play D&D, like, blah, blah, blah. We have Tuesday night guys night at my cousin's house. We go play in the basement. Like, I was like, y'all, <laughs> it's too nerdy for me. Um, I'll come watch, but it's, it's, it's a lot for the first year or so of our relationship. Uh, I admired D and D from the background, um, because a lot of it was, I was scared of the, 
the improv and the role play aspect of it, I was not strong in my ability to do that. And they are very role play heavy in the games that he plays. So it was very intimidating. So I was very slow to join in. Um, and we host a, uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic RPG game at our house every so often. And all of our friends were involved with that. And I was like, Oh, it looks so like so much fun, but everyone's so into it. And everyone is so good at role playing. Like, I don't, I don't want to be the weak link. I don't like, it's so intimidating. And then they, they finished like the first episode of that. And they invited me in to come in in the second episode. We did that. And it was based on Saga, the Saga rules and stuff like that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Saga edition. Little different than like normal D&D. Um, around Christmas time, the first year my boyfriend and I were dating, um, he was like, all right, I, I'm getting my kids dice for Christmas. They're going to learn how to play D&D and you're going to learn how to play D&D. And if they can learn how to play, so can you. And I was just like, okay, <laughs> I guess that's it then. And here we are. Um, now I'm playing D&D all the time and, um, I've gotten friends hooked into D&D and, uh, you know, my boyfriend runs a D&D live stream now. And so D&D is very, very full in our house. And then I got hired as a community manager for a miniature company. So. <laughs> so now you live the D&D life. Yes. And I got to go to D&D live this year. So that was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. So how long ago was that then that you sat down and played your first, I guess, uh, Star Wars saga game? It's been, it's been about three and a half years. Wow. Okay. That's, I mean, that's a fast, that's fast to go from, I don't have this hobby to this is my job. (laughs) You know, and I'm, I'm no longer scared of the role play aspect. I love role playing. Um, our, our Star Wars game is very role play heavy because we're all Star Wars nerds. And so there's lots of references and there's lots of all of that. And everyone gets so immersed. Like I literally feel like I'm on Mandalore or whatever when I'm sitting at my kitchen table for like seven hours. So I'm not surprised because uh, we were talking before we started recording and you mentioned that uh, you do theater, that you are an actress. And so I'm not surprised to hear that the two go hand in hand. Uh, You know, I have talked about this before. I I did a lot of theater. I worked in theater professionally um, before I started working in role playing games and stuff. And so I'm not surprised that that you enjoy the role play aspects and that the two go hand in hand. When you sat down, what was it that intimidated you about this versus, you know, acting for an audience of people? I've always been terrible at improv. And that was the part that was intimidating for me. Um, whether it comes to like improv and music or improv and theater and stuff, it was never my strong suit. I was always very technical and stuff like that. And I've actually come to find, especially with, Being with such amazing role players in these campaigns that I play, they really push me to be better and they help me stay immersed so that it's easy to make those character choices and stay in the role play and not be afraid of it. Yeah, that's actually a a great way to put it, right? If you can trust the people you're with, and that's a big tenet of improv too, right? Is you need to be able to trust uh, the the people you're performing with. Have you managed to get any other actors uh, or theater types into, you know, role-playing games since you've started playing? Yes. My best friend, when he lived in Georgia with us, um, he is also an actor. He does a lot of theater stuff back in Texas. Um, We got him involved in D&D. Our DM for our Star Wars game, he is a local Atlanta actor. His name is Patrick Logan. He's amazing. Um, And he started out playing in the Star Wars game, and now he took over as DM. And his his world building skills are insane. And he's also like an amazing actor and improver and stuff like that. So it's so great getting to work with him. (laughs) The way his mind works is it's so creative and so just there's so many layers. Like we have just this running list of side missions and we're just like, Oh yeah, that's still a thing that we should probably do. (laughs) And it's been like months since that happened. Like there's just so many layers and it's, Oh, 
And he's like, well, you know, we'll, we'll get to this. Like everything you do has consequences. Everything you do, like chain reaction, blah, blah, blah. And so he's building it around us. It's intricate. It's insane, but it's amazing. Those are great game masters who are, uh, you know, building the world with their players in that way is, is huge. It's one of those games that you wish everybody could see and watch and be a part of because it's so, for lack of better words, like life changing because you really do like get so immersed into it. And these battles that we do, like these are lasting consequences, like throughout the galaxy. And (laughs) you just, you want everyone to understand how amazing this game is. (laughs) But no, it's been that the Star Wars game has been a, like a, three three year game but you know we play regular 5e at the house too sure i promise you we're going to get to eldritch foundry too but i have so many questions now uh based on what you've told me so far because i'm uh, i'm super curious about you said that you were playing saga edition which is a uh, you know for people who don't know it's a wizards of the coast version of the star wars role-playing game that sort of came out in the 3.5 days uh, kind of between 3.5 and 4 and it has you know a, a lot of the 3.5 aspects in it but now you're playing fifth who who made this conversion how did you make this happen our star wars game has been broken up into quote-unquote episodes and so mm-hmm. we had one person DM the first two episodes. And then when we when Patrick decided he wanted to DM and that our DM wanted to be a player, we were like, okay, we kind of sat down and assessed. And my my boyfriend is very he's very technical and very good with like rules and like all of that. And he should be. He's running a DD live stream, so I would hope he's good at those things. But they kind of had a powwow and they were like, look, while we love playing Saga because there's just so many like weird, fun things you can do with it, it is a very broken system and we were all very, very overpowered Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they managed to find a 5e homebrew that they really liked and that it was it was way more balanced it the rules were easier and we had a couple of new players coming in as well that had mm-hmm. never played before ever and so yeah. they were like now would probably be a good time to go ahead and switch over if we were all playing the same character cuz some people had died some people had not so <laughs> for those of us that were still playing the same character it was an easy conversion to get everything switched over I do miss my saga version of my character because it was awesome. But (laughs) sure, sure. But the 5e, it's so much it's so much more simple and easy to to work with and introduce people into. It's very cool that you're, you know, running sort of a homebrew hacked up version of that. I've seen some people do that with Star Wars and it is it's super cool. And it's great because you don't necessarily have to learn something totally new. Especially when you're getting people to play, you're like, hey, look, you don't really need to, you know, it's, it just works this way. The force works this way. And now we all know how the force works and we're good to go, right? So it took out, it took out a lot of the complicated stuff. Like Saga had all these things like destiny points and force points and like all these different things of like, oh, you could spend a destiny point to like not have that nat one happen Mm -hmm. or stuff like that. And it's just like, it's fun, but it's a lot. Yes. And 5B really just like simplifies everything. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to take a quick break to let you know that Tabletop Babble is brought to you this week by Elderwood Academy. Elderwood Academy are the makers of handcrafted, incredible gaming accessories. Everything from deck boxes to dice towers to these incredible spellbook boxes, of which I have two two of them, count them, that you can use to bring dice, cards, miniatures, pencils, whatever you need to your next game. But hey, it doesn't stop there. They have dice, they have hex dice chests, they have mini dice and mini hex dice chests that attach to your keychain. You're ready to game anytime. Pretty awesome. You're going to want to go check it out over at elderwoodacademy.com slash don't split. That's elderwoodacademy.com slash don't split. 
Also this week, Tabletop Babble is brought to you by the gentle folks at NerdArchy. NerdArchy is having a Kickstarter for their out-of-the-box encounters, and it's already funded and like way overfunded. It's almost done smashing through stretch goals. You are going to want to get over there and check it out right away before it ends less than a week. Go check it out right now. Right now, the Book of Encounters is designed to make running 5th edition effortless. And guess what? I wrote one of the encounters. Woo! You're going to want to check that out because you like me, right? Probably if you're listening to this show. If you don't, that's weird. It's weird. Um, And I'm sorry, frankly, that you're listening to this show if you don't like me. But you probably, even if you don't like me, you'll love Nerdarchy. You know why? The Nerdarchy team is amazing. Their design chops are through the roof. And each encounter in the book is full of content that can be used to fill the gaps in between adventures, hook your characters into a new story, or have an entire campaign built around them. They're packed with wilderness and dungeon encounters. The book already has all areas of play covered from sword and spell slinging to puzzles to social interaction plus it's not just me working on it we're talking about lisa penrose we're talking about matt mercer all kinds of awesome stuff check it out at nerdarchy.com that's nerdarchy.com tell them dspn sent you let's get back to the babble Okay, so you're doing this stuff. How does Eldridge Foundry come about? Was it already in existence? Are you part of the team that helped uh, make Eldridge Foundry what it is? Uh, tell me about that. They were they were up and coming when I joined in. I found out about them. It's it's kind of a weird story. So, like I've mentioned, my boyfriend and his best friend they co DM a D uh, a D and D live stream. They watch Critical Role. And through watching Critical Role, they discovered this guy named Ilya Salnikov, who has done some insane animated critter art. And if you if you saw the Critical Role Game of Thrones intro video, yes, that's Ilya. That is Ilya and his magic talent. So they discovered Ilya, and they're like, "We really like his style." Blah blah blah. And so Ilya made their intro. For their stream. In doing that, they got to know Ilya. And Ilya was like, hey, I am the concept artist for this up-and-coming customizable miniatures company called Eldritch Foundry. And once they kind of, like, get the ball rolling a little bit, we'd, you know, love to, like, sponsor you guys and make, you know, your party minis and stuff like that. Let's fast forward probably about five or six months to about January, the stream has started and Eldritch is kind of, they're getting their feet underneath them and they reach out to Dustin and Devin and they're like, Hey, you know, our ball, our ball is rolling a little bit. We need a social media person slash community manager type person to help us with that because we have these things coming up that we're going to do and we don't know we're not good at social media and we're not good at that kind of (laughs) of stuff. And so, you know, Dustin, my boyfriend recommended me outside of being his girlfriend. (laughs) Um, he was like, Hey, Ashley has done social media for some other people. Um, and so I think she would be a good, she knows the D and D world. She knows she, you know, she loves it as a hobby and she knows social media. I think she would be a really good fit. And so they interviewed me and it was pretty much almost hired on the spot. So they were like, help us. We need help with the social media because we're just no good at it. Work your magic. And so I started doing that and Um, started doing a lot of community managing stuff, which I did a lot of that at D and D live where I get to just go and talk to people and network and stuff like that, which I love doing. And I'm really good at (laughs) that was back in February and they were like, okay, so we got to get this ball rolling because we have this Kickstarter that we're doing in May. And so we have to get our, like our ducks in a row and all of that. Let's go. And I mean, it's, that again, that was back in February, and here we are. It's almost August, so uh, it's been a very fast 
paced thing, but I absolutely love this job so much. Oh, good. I mean, that's uh, incredible. And what uh, what y'all are doing over there at Eldridge Foundry is amazing. So I guess uh, let's start off with like, what is Eldridge Fa- uh, Foundry? What do you do? So Eldridge Foundry is still an up and coming 3D printed customizable miniatures company. So gotcha. we are we are post Kickstarter. We had a Kickstarter happen the beginning of May and it ran for a month. We were expecting like, oh, you know, we're maybe we'll have a couple hundred backers and we set our goal <laughs> we set our goal at thirty thousand dollars. Because we were like, that's uh-huh. reasonable, that's enough to like keep everything going to to keep moving forward. Uh we hit that in the first three hours. Mm-hmm. And then it was just like, okay, that that happened. And we were all like just dumbfounded and humbled by it. And within the month, we raised over $500,000. We had over 20,000 minis ordered in our Kickstarter. Oh my gosh. Uh, So what, I mean, what does fulfillment look like? (laughs) We ended our Kickstarter in the beginning of June. And Mm -hmm. in these past uh, few months, we have been working on getting the stretch goals that we had funded, which were the different races, different genres, different, um, different options for people to choose from. We've been, we've been working, getting that ready to go because we didn't want to launch our website with only fantasy options because that's, that's not a good impression on anyone. That's not going to help us stick out Mm -hmm. or anything like that. And everyone's just going to be impatient on what, you know, when is, when is this coming out? When is this coming out? We wanted to go ahead and have like a decent library of options. And so that's what our Kickstarter was kind of geared more towards was opening up those options to get them developed as quickly as possible. What do you think separates you from the, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, competition, right? Other companies that are doing custom 3D printed minis and things like that. What what makes you different? So we print with a resin-like material instead of just like a premium plastic. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's still like a plastic that we use in our 3D printing, but we use a, a resin-like material called a photopolymer. Gotcha. Uh, and okay. the way our our printer is designed, our printer can print up to up to about seventy minis at one time. Wow! Um, it's very high tech. It's very fun. Um, but it prints the minis and encodes them in wax. And so instead of three D printed supports and flashes and stuff like that on our minis, it's all wax. When it's done printing. It's in like a little wax shell and we take the mini and we throw it in a quote unquote fryer of sorts. <laughs> it's not really a fryer, but it, when you, so when you see it like, yes, when you see it like dissolve and stuff, it, it looks like a fryer. Um, gotcha. but we take the mini and we put it in this fryer type thing and it melts the wax. And so you don't have the little flashes. We don't have any seam lines or print lines in our minis. We really have been pushing the quality of our printing um, as much as possible and trying to achieve that, that high quality. Yeah. It sounds like there would be a lot of, um, you know, QA and work kind of that goes into that. Yes. On top of, you know, pushing the, the high quality of the printing and, you know, we've played around with different materials. We've, you know, we've played with the, the gray, the gray print material. We've played with the, the clear material just to find which ones are better. Um, and, you know, or if, you know, or if they're equal, then, you know, we can offer, Hey, you know, I'd like clear versions of my, of my character so that, you know, if my bard can cast invisibility or something, I have a clear version of my mini and that could be a viable option down the road. But one thing we're super excited for is Ilya has worked really hard to, give us very distinct races and not have our races look like they're just stretched and like stretched and pulled or shortened versions 
of each other to where they're all the the same type of build, but you can just like make them taller or just add pointed ears or, you know, add some weight to it. Like we want all of our races. We want our humans to look very distinct from our elves. We want our dwarves to look very distinct from our humans. We want everything to have its own unique look and feel. Mm -hmm. And he's done a great job at achieving that. Um, And I think everyone's going to be really excited when they see how distinct everything looks. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the fascinating things, right? Being on the website and seeing sort of the the different distinct looks, um, you know, it reminds me of how in 5th edition, they were saying like, you know, previous editions of D&D, when we drew a halfling, we used to have to put something in there for scale so you knew it was a halfling, right? And so in 5e, the goal was like, let's make sure you know what a halfling is, even if it's just a photo of a halfling, you know, or a, or a drawing rather of a halfling, nothing else around them, nothing in the background. You can still look at them and say, that's not a human. That's a halfling. We know that, right? I am reminded of that as I look at your website and the the offerings that are here on the thing. But the other thing that uh, strikes me as interesting <laughs> is that you have a whole lore section on your website and you have a lore like most of the time when you go on to a website like this where they build custom minis, there isn't this story, this lore that goes along with it. So what's that about? Not only did we want our minis to be different and unique, but we also wanted the experience um, mm-hmm. of, of making your mini to be unique as well. So when our website launches, it will be a super fun, it's kind of based off old school RPG character builders that you would you know, have from like Baldur's Gate or Planescape Torment or Skyrim or stuff like that. And so we've created this world building feel to Mm -hmm. the mini creation process so that it's not just, you know, gray mini on like a grayscale background and, you know, it's just kind of standing there and floating and stuff like that. We wanted it to be, you know, our wizard comes in and he's part of the creation process and it's very, you have all the different options that pop out in the, the different sections instead of just like a running list library of stuff. But some people were like, well, I don't really understand why you're including lore. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a fun thing. <laughs> but like some people love lore. And so sure. for those people are going to really dig it. Um, but a lot of people, they're like, I, it, I could care less. Sure, you just want to go, I just want to build my dwarf that I'm going to use in D&D, right? But the reason why we have the lore section, the reason why our races are named differently is because one of our stretch goals was that our amazing lore master, Patrick Stewart, if we reached a, a certain stretch goal, he would release all of our lore as a campaign setting. And we reached that stretch goal And so everything that he's written, everything that he's built, all of that will now be like a playable campaign setting that'll be released as like a book. And so you had also mentioned, right, that you didn't want just sort of, uh, you get here, you see the traditional fantasy stuff. So talk to me a little bit then about that. Like, uh, is that part of the lore? Are we just, is this a traditional fantasy world or what are we seeing? The world that we created is called... uh, Ood, if I pronounce okay. that correctly. <laughs> Got it. Um, and we have we have our wizard who what has like fallen down from the gods, and he he has helped you, the player, create these special like beings with magic and stuff like that. And while it is kind of in a fantasy setting, um, even though like our options will include, we'll have like steampunk, we'll have like noir, we'll have like modern, we'll event, we will eventually get to like, like superhero stuff. Like we plan to have as many of those options as possible, but the campaign itself, it's in its own world, its own setting, but it is for lack of better terms in its own like little fantasy world. Patrick is amazing. And so a lot of people, a lot of people are probably familiar with his work because it's not a uh, not a uh, Captain Picard, Patrick Stewart. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. We should we should mention that. It's not Captain Picard, but this is um, you know, Patrick has been designing games for a long time. Uh I you know, he is one of the first names I hit when I started uh doing my thing with podcasts and with game design and you know, in uh, Google Plus. Uh he was big time and that sort of thing and uh yeah, he's done a lot with the OSR, uh, as well as just sort of in-game design in general. So yeah, he's great. So talented. So the campaign setting is going to be amazing. I can't personally wait to play in it. Well, that's cool. And it will it be system neutral? Like you can play sort of whatever, hey, you know, you want to do D&D, great. You want to do something else, great. You can do that too. Yes. The big things that we wanted to encompass with our minis were, were D&D and war games. But sure, and then War Games also opens up another way for people to engage with your product as well, right? We're hopefully, if it kills us, the plan is to launch our mini-making website middle to end of September. Wow, okay. And then everyone will be able to start making minis and all of that. Um, And then towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, we plan to release a custom monster creator. Cool. Which cool. is one of our things that we are super excited for because no one I else love is that. doing it. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about this monster creator. Am I restricted to one size or can I make, you know, big, big monsters? Uh, absolutely. We want you to be able to create the monsters of your dreams that, you know, if you can't find a mini for this monster that you want in your game, you should be able to go and make it. You have made my dreams come true, my nightmares, as it were, because that is the kind of creatures I'll be creating with this thing. So you have this uh, this sort of big plan, um, and you have been working on getting everything out there. It looks like people can still pre-order stuff through Backer Kit. Is yes. that right? So we opened up the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter ended, but when we got to the Backer Kit portion of the post post Kickstarter timeline. We decided that, you know, if people missed out on the Kickstarter, we didn't want them to completely miss out on going ahead and getting a mini secured. So we opened up pre-orders and in our pre-orders, on our pre-order site, we also have things like t-shirts with Ilya's art on it. We have stickers of our concept art and our logo and stuff like that. So we have some other fun stuff that we've added in there as like a you know, oh, come pre-order, but also here's some other fun stuff while you're waiting for us to launch. Nice. So that's cool that you still have a way for people to engage and and do that kind of thing while you're getting your website fully operational. As far as uh, your website goes, and um, obviously people are going to look forward to building characters, building monsters, getting access to lore, things like that. What else are you thinking about in the future that you are allowed to talk about right now? Our other biggest thing that separates us from everyone else is that we have an affiliate program with game stores. If a game store wants to be part of the affiliate program, then we provide them a tablet to put up in their store so that, you know, say your Wi-Fi goes out, you know, first, first world problems, (laughs) say your Wi-Fi goes out (laughs) and you need to make an NPC or you need to make a, a new mini for a new game or a new monster or whatever, then you can pop over to your local game store and they'll have a tablet with the website on it. And you can make a mini in store and the affiliate stores will also have like special promotional items. Like they'll have, you know, shields with their game store logo on them and like fun little, little things like that, um, that you can only get if you make a mini in store. We provide the tablet for them so they don't have to provide it. They don't have to rent it from us. We just give it to them. They set up a little station and players can come make minis in store and they can either have the mini shipped to their house or, you know, if you live in an apartment complex where your mini might get lost because the mail system sucks in your apartment complex, you can have your mini shipped to the store. And if you have, if your mini is made in store and or shipped to the store, you get free shipping on your mini and the game store shares in the profits from it. We really wanted to 
partner up with game stores and really figure out a way to include them and help them out because we love our friendly local game stores. And where would we be (laughs) without them? Of course. Yeah. No, I I love that you're supporting local friendly game stores. That is incredible. So listen, this is amazing. I want to build a mini right now. How do I convince someone else to paint my minis for me? (laughs) So that is a great question. Um, We've had a lot of people ask, you know, oh, will minis come painted? Will, you know, what if if I suck at painting minis or if I need someone else to paint it for Mm -hmm. me? Like, what can I do? We will be keeping like a running tab of mini painters so that, and we'll have like a marketplace of sorts towards the end of the mini creation process to where if you need that service, we have a list of people for you to choose from. Not everyone, not everyone can paint their minis. Not everyone wants to paint their minis. For, I mean, a hundred percent. That is me. I, I will cop to, I cannot make minis or I can't paint minis. I can't make them either. And, uh, I would love for, you know, th- that's the thing is I always want to go on to build a custom one. And then I'm like, ah, then I got to find somebody to paint in and yada, yada. Uh, this sounds like it makes it a lot easier to do that. We, we are trying to think of everything to just, just help everybody out. We want your mini creation process to be fun and not stress you out. Nice. Well, that is excellent. Well, thank you uh, so much for, uh, for hopping on here today to talk with me before we go. Where can people find you on the internet? You can find Eldritch Foundry on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at, um, at Eldritch Foundry. Me personally, I am Babs the Bat on pretty much all of the socials. That was a great conversation. You are going to want to go check out more on the Eldritch Foundry website. So go check it out. You know, people, if you want to support Tabletop Babel, you can by heading on over to my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash intracasso. For as low as $1 a month, you'll get a survey that will help steer the direction of the podcast. You can vote on upcoming topics, and you'll also get to determine content that comes out out through that Patreon and on my blog, World Builder Blog. Plus, if you contribute at higher levels, you'll get even more content from me. Articles, videos, that kind of thing. So go check it out at patreon.com slash intracasso. If you're already there and you're already giving, thank you so much. I so, 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 so appreciate it. It is huge. And you know, if you can't support the show financially, that's A-OK. That's really super duper okay. I appreciate your ears. But if you want to do something for us, head on over to iTunes, create a free account, leave us a review. It'll take five minutes. You can rate us. You can rate all the podcasts in your life, and we will very much appreciate it. Even if you're not using iTunes to listen to podcasts, odds are the podcatcher app you're using is using those algorithms, the iTunes algorithms, to rate and recommend podcasts to others. So go, leave us a review. If you leave a five-star review, I will read it out loud and credit the person who left it. You can make me say anything you want, like Kiter1973 from Australia, who left a review entitled, Very Good, and it reads, here we go, word for word, Tabletop Babble and James put on a fine podcast for all gamers. Apart from a misguided belief that bedroom antics are somehow similar to role-playing games, most likely an indication that James probably purchases and reads too many game books and not enough centerfold-style publications that contain tips and tricks to help him get rid of this puerile punchline. <laughs> Guests are interesting, topics are well selected, and I particularly like the episode on feedback and his willingness to read out any five-star review on his show. In addition to fixing his glitch joke, I would like to recommend James look up Loof16 as a loudness controller to make the stitched bits not stick out. Maybe you should check out Hindenburg Systems. Well, thank you so much, Kiter1973. I will take all of this under advice. I will take it all under advisement. And really, thank you for the review. I cannot thank you enough. If you're out there uh, somewhere else than the United States, we really, really could use your review uh, helping other people find the show. Um, People in the U.S., we need your reviews too. I promise. 
I promise you're all equally important to me. And I love you all so, so much for listening to this show and for rating and recommending us on iTunes. People, you can find me on Twitter at James Intracasso. That's at J-A-M-E-S-I-N-T-R-O-C-A-S-O. Also, check out my blog, World Builder Blog, which is all about the game design stuff that I am doing. And it's got all kinds of free stuff on there for you as well, like the magic items that I posted just last week. So go check it out at worldbuilderblog.com. Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding it with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget, RPGs aren't like sex. Hey everybody, before you go, I just wanted to let you know that Tabletop Babble this week was brought to you by 1985 Games. Dungeon Craft is a new book filled with cutout game pieces that lets you create an engaging world for your next campaign. Put down your marker and use the pieces from the book to craft your world in real time. Dungeon Craft provides rivers, trees, caves, buildings, hordes of monsters, dragons, chests, spiritual weapons, and so much more. Simply cut out the 1,000 plus terrain pieces that are in the book and place it on a map. Unlike 3D terrain, Dungeon Craft doesn't require much storage space. When you receive a copy of Dungeon Craft, all the terrain pieces come bound in a spiral book. Simply cut out the pieces you need and all the other pieces will be left in place. All the pieces can easily be stored in a binder. The whole book can fit neatly into any backpack for on-the-go dungeon mastering. Also available are the Hell or High Water companion books. Yes! These two companion books were made to be used with Wizards of the Coast next two releases, Ghosts of Saltmarsh and Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. For more information on Dungeon Craft and to pledge for your copy, go to www.1985games.com Well, it's been a while since I heard of www. Anyway, go to 1985games.com Those are all numerals, the 1985games.com and make sure you tell them DSPN sent you.